Hello, everybody at home. Uh, thank you for tuning in to our weekly poetry series. I'm Nicole, the manager at Read It Again Bookstore, and I'm joined tonight by poets BK Duan and Greg Santos, who's coming to us all the way from Canada. Uh, I think this is our first international poetry night, uh, so it's exciting. Uh, the way the formatting is going to work tonight, each poet will read for 15 minutes, followed by a discussion on craft. Viewers, feel free to make comments or ask questions throughout, and we'll respond to them at the end of the readings. Uh, BK is going to read first. He is a Cambodian-American writer and critic and the author of Ghoul, and So I Was Blessed, both published by NYQ Books, uh, The Doctor Will Fix It, published by Shabda Press, and Dead Tongue, a chapbook with Joanna C. Valente uh, of Yes Poetry. He teaches at Union College in Schenectady, New York, and tweets at uh, Bung Kong Tuan. All right, BK, when uh, screen goes big, you're free to read. Okay. All right, so uh, I think I'm going to read uh, mainly from uh, my first book, uh, Gruel, um, because uh, I'm reading with Greg Santos, and uh, I was rereading his uh, book, Ghostface, and uh, it shares uh, some of the theme, thematic obsessions that my book also shares. Um, uh, history and, and trauma and identity and memory and of course ghost and haunting um, so I'll, I'll read the the first book I mean the first poem in the book um, uh, because you you have a narrator who is bringing his wife uh, to his family's home for the first time uh, and um, and introducing uh, her uh, to the idea that this place uh, is, is haunted. Um, the house of many voices. You can, get you can get lost if you pay attention to the creaking in the sad murmurs underneath the floorboard. I told my wife, whatever you do, don't look over your shoulder or you will be, or you will be snagged by a ghost of rice paddies and water buffalo. Its heavy black hair still wet from the mists of yesteryears. Or a ghost of the missing sun, whose memory lives in the furtive glances of uncles and aunts. In the grandmother who refuses death. There are many ghosts here. Listen, I was caught by one of those ghosts the other day. And I'm telling you this, passing it on to you, not in some spirit of generosity, but so that I can be free. And this next poem um, uh, is a poem that I'm sure um, you know, a lot of Cambodian uh, American uh, writers, uh, Cambodian writers of the diaspora, uh, uh, I feel like there's an obligation for us to uh, have a poem about the Cambodian genocide because it's um, it's part of our legacy, our, our history. Um, so let me get that there. Inheritance. My uncles, aunts, and grandmother all agree. It was a difficult time. People starving, you don't trust the children, you don't trust your neighbors, friends, even your family. But this can't be. It must be something I read, something I taught, pointed out in a lecture, maybe discovered in a conversation with a survivor, a man with ashen hair and toothless smile, in an apartment complex in Lowell, Massachusetts. Anyway, these are the images I carry with me. Ribcage thin, diarrhea, chicken blindness, dysentery, hands tied behind your back, legs too weak to crawl, eyes bulging, white with petrification, irises back as night, irises black as night, wings broken, spirit destroyed, only paranoia and hunger ruled the day. In the night, my mother's body, difficulty with breathing, bones sharp as knives, 
eternal loneliness, eternal sadness, the sour taste of tamarind, mother dead from starvation, her sister, a branch in hand, sharpened by hunger, hunting for lizards, snakes, crickets, or dark green leaves, all black, black pajamas, black hair, black sadness, always night, always cold, cold wind and loneliness, fear of whispering wind and unseen eyes, pineapple eyes, everywhere and nowhere, strangers, friends, family disappearing, without struggle, without a sound. The only evidence is to fear in those trembling, working in the fields, lips so dry it hurts when it rains, the corpse is thrown about as if for a group pose, in a ditch along the dirt road, plastic bag wrapped around the heads, a statement on the value of human life, unworthy of a single bullet. Their motto, to kill you is no loss, but what is loss is family, the old way of life, being human, and what is gain is a new world order. Monks disrobed, temples destroyed, elders useless. The new temple is a pyramid of human skulls, where a boy, illiterate and verging on puberty, dressed in black pajamas, an AK-47 on his back, a grama around his neck, guards the entrance. His old family gone, his new family is, in, is the organization. His new mother is hate, his new father is Anka. To each everything must be reported Anka. The figurehead, the godhead, the master of the universe, from which to which everything revolves. The giver and taker of life, human or otherwise, the maker of reality. Um, this next poem is um, is actually the original title of uh, this book, uh, Under the Tamarind Tree. Uh, yeah. And um, I think it's, it's one of the few poems uh, that I wrote early in my life uh, and that I'm very proud of. Um, uh, it's, a, it's a poem about the memory uh, that I had of my mother. Uh, uh, it's her, um, let me look at what page that is on. Under the Tamarind Tree, the child sits on the lap of his aunt under the old Tamarind Tree outside the family home. The tree stands still, quiet, indifferent. The house sways on stilts. Monks in saffron robes and nuns with shaved heads, lips darkened with beaten nut stain, sit chanting prayers for the child's mother. Incense perfumes the hot dry air, there emerges a strange familiar song between the child and his aunt that day, a distant one, melodic but harsh, as if the strings as if the strings are drawn too tight. Each time the child hears prayers coming from the house, he cries. Each time he cries, the aunt, a girl herself, pinches the boy's thigh. So that's uh, a poem about my mother's death. Um, and here's this one. Um, when we first arrived in America, um, we encountered snow, which was uh, unheard of uh, in Cambodia, uh, in uh, Southeast Asia. And, uh, and snow was a kind of a, a symbol of, of the magic that is uh, America uh, for us back then. First snow. 
We huddle behind the back door of our sponsor's house. My uncle, the bravest because he spoke a little English, went out. My grandmother, aunts, and I watched him through the kitchen window. He bent down, reached for the whiteness of this new world, and put some in his mouth. He looked back at us and smiled. We can make snow cones with this. America, the miraculous, our savior, you were the land of dreams then. So this is that same uncle that was in First Snow. Um, and, uh, you know, he owned a video store. And this is a poem about that. Uh, I'm sure, anyway, let me just read this. Um, my uncle got up at five, drove his wife to work, dropped his sister and brother-in-law at the train station, took his children to school, returned home to have breakfast. He ate gruel with salted fish as if he had just escaped from the Khmer Rouge. After three years, eight months, and 20 days of hard labor, rice and water never tasted better. He drank hot jasmine tea with the TV news blasting, paying attention to words like crimes, human rights abuses, tribunal, prosecution, looking up indictment, custody, in his Huffman and Prom English Command Dictionary. By 9 a.m., my uncle unlocked the deadbolt to his store, picked the videos from the return box, cleared them in his computer, and when the bell rang, he looked up smiling. Good morning, welcome to King Videos, as if he were the luckiest man alive. So this is a poem for all those immigrants and refugees um, who came here and um, you know, they still uh, retain their old ways. Um, and um, and I, I'm always impressed with how my elders made it. Uh, not only survived the, the Khmer Rouge um, and the genocide and the refugee camps, but also survive America. And, uh, you know, they, they, they love fishing. And this is the point about them going to fishing. Uh, uh, fishing for Trey Plateau. You might have seen them fishing on the shores of the Cape Cod Canal. My uncle in his fisherman's hat, pulling a one-foot scup, my aunt in her pajama-like pants walking backward up the bike path, snapping a line that's gotten stuck between the rocks. My other aunt reeling in a sea bass, her husband by her side directing. Bikers, jockers, teenagers in their dates, families with their children look curiously on. Or maybe you've seen them lining up all three sides of a pier in Salem, their wrists jerking in a language that bewitches the squids below. They're not the only ones. Other Cambodians and Vietnamese, once enemies, fish side by side on the same American pier. Other immigrants, Chinese, Spanish, Portuguese, speaking languages I can't understand, come together on this spot, sacred rods in hands, beckoning the squid. Or maybe you've seen them under a bridge fishing the Providence River, looking for Trey Plateau, a type of mackerel they used to eat in the refugee camps in Thailand. Sometimes my aunts and uncle run into an old friend from those long ago days. They talk about the lack of food, of sneaking out that night to fish, and of running 
always running from the Thai police. They exchange phone numbers, share fishing secrets, and set up a time and place where they'll fish together again. When they get home, my aunts gut the fish, clean them, fry them, put them in boiling stew of galangal, lemongrass, and kaffir leaves. My uncles and aunts sit in a circle on the floor, eat, and tell stories of how this fish got away or how one of them got caught by the Thai police. No matter how hard they try, they can never understand why my cousin and I ever bother with fishing, why we catch and release food as if it's some sport. Okay, uh, one more poem. And this one, uh, Greg Santos uh, published in his uh, uh, magazine, Carte Blanche. Um, and uh, this is from The Doctor Will Fix It, uh, my third collection. And it's about raising my daughter in contemporary America. Um, but the poem itself is harkens back to the Khmer Rouge and, and you know what what it means to be a survivor and uh and also a father um, um, uh, you know, after uh, what happened to uh, to our people page eight moon and Khmer, you are light when the sun is punched out and darkness reigns you are the antidote to what came before. Black blood, black heart, hands tied, kneeling before a ditch of human bones. Your laughter pierces the silence of night that bore witness to the one's blood-soaked land. Your existence is resistant to the genocide that orphaned your father and drove his family out of the homeland. You are love against the hate of the Khmer Rouge. This is the meaning of your name, Janda. This is how to defeat Bull Boat. That's it. That's uh, my poem to my daughter. That was lovely. Thank you so much. Thanks. I hope I didn't experience any technical difficulty there. No, it was good. All right. That was uh, great. Yeah. Great. Great. And now, uh, now Greg is going to share with us before uh, the conversation. So Greg Santos is the author of Blackbirds, published in 2018, Rabbit Punch, published in 2014, and The Emperor's Sofa, published in 2010. And he has a new book, Ghost Face, that will be coming out very soon. Uh, he holds an MFA in creative writing from New York City's The New School and regularly works with at-risk communities as a creative writing instructor and teaches at the Thomas More Institute. He is the editor-in-chief of the Quebec Writers Federation's online literary literary journal Carte Blanche, and is an adoptee of Cambodian, Spanish, and Portuguese descent. He lives in Montreal, Quebec, Canada with his family. All right, Greg. Yes. Could you put your try try with your headphones? Okay. Sure, Sorry, sure. it was just no, all of the time. Good to know. Did you hear anything of what I said? I didn't. No. Oh, okay. So let's try this again. Yeah. No. <laughs> okay. So. Okay, I think that. All right. Hopefully, everybody can hear me. Uh, sorry for the technical difficulty. Um, so, um, I was um, going to uh, say thank you again uh, to do uh, it again uh, for uh, the opportunity to be a part of this evening and uh, for BK who asked me to be a part of this. Uh, it's uh, it was a real honor to be able to hear you read and uh, to share your poem. So, uh, right, today I'm going to be sharing poems from a book that has not yet come out. Uh, it's called Ghost Face, and uh, it is in the works, and uh, you can pre-order it. Um, so, um, 
Yeah, so I'll be sharing from uh, from from uh, George Pitt. And uh, it's also been wonderful to hear uh, these kids from beforehand, and I feel like there is a lot uh, that we uh, do share in common and uh, that we have uh, s some of those uh, that go together. Um, and so I'm just going to read the first poem here, and it's titled Cambodian. Are you Cambodian? So, you were born in Cambodia then. Have you ever even been to Cambodia? Then how can you consider yourself Cambodian? How do you mean? Most folks think you're Filipino. How did that make you feel? It's the last name. Santos throws them off. Santos, it's Portuguese, right? Honestly, this is confusing. It's like you're actually Cambodian or something. Um, yeah, so uh, as was mentioned, uh, I'm uh, Cambodian uh, uh, by um, ancestry. Uh, I was an adoptee and um, uh, was adopted as an infant. And so lots of the poems in Ghostface touch on my juggling with these uh, multifaceted parts of my identity. And um, it's been quite interesting to do that. Uh, this next uh, poem is called I'm Dog. Who are you? And uh, there is a little epigraph before that's from an article in the New York Times on the fallout of the Khmer Rouge and the Cambodian genocide, which says people who thought differently were called worms, dogs, traitors. Once in a hospital waiting room with my father, another child kept turning around to look at me, singing Ching, Chong Chow. His tinny song went on and on. I did not know how to react. Ignoring the boy did nothing. My first response was to bare my teeth. Bark, bark, bark. I grinned wide-eyed. The boy hid. My father stared. When my children were younger, they used to scream, terrorized, running in the opposite direction when a dog walked by. In Cambodia, they once feared Vak Dumak, one with a gun, coward who killed millions, his own people. Words were used as knives. Children would turn on their parents. The wrong sentence was a life sentence. Pressing my whiskered face to theirs, my, child, my children need my fur in their tiny hands. I'm dog. Embrace my dogness. Are you dog too? Um, and this poem, actually, I want to say thank you to uh, BK uh, for helping me with uh, one of the pronunciation of one of these words and that it, um, also the, the use of it. Um, and the title of this poem is called Khmer for Baby. In my past life, did I have a name? Or was I just Tiro? Journal entry. If I ever visit Cambodia, I wonder what it will be like to be met with smiling faces that look like mine. Will I feel at home or utterly alone? I asked this question before I had my children, my links to my past present, and future. Um, this next poem goes uh, back to uh, my childhood, and you'll see uh, um, that uh, I, I, it was a very <laughs> fun one. Uh, childhood. Taking Polaroid pictures of my Transformers, dancing to Michael Jackson's Smooth Criminal before my parents' mirror, Pretending the pool cleaning robot was a sea monster. Wrestling with Tata, my grandmother, breaking her glasses. Making my pet rocks uh, its cloth bed, tightening its leash. My goldfish, Tom, Jerry. My hermit crabs, Big Bertha, Hermie. My dwarf hamsters, Nutmeg, Tiger, Lucky. 
My sea monkeys, Sharky, Finn, Minnie, Mickey, George, uh, Tiny Tim, Mo, Cutie Pie, Cuddles, Flip, Sprinkle, Joy, uh, Micro Machine, Bumblebee, Marco, Polo, Chocolate Chip. At the barber, hiding Playboy in The Economist. My terror of clowns. My parents paying my birthday clown to leave. Book after my parents. Why was I adopted? My long-standing belief in ghosts. Dear ghosts. One cold, rainy spring evening, as I was drifting off to sleep, M showed me a passage from a new book. Here, a part about the universe. Atoms. Atoms, such a beautiful word, like cellar door and hope. Read this, you might want it for your book. In it, I read how when things die, their atoms don't disappear or cease to exist, but are redistributed. An ancient fern becomes coal. This lump of coal begets a diamond, and on and on until the atoms of the fern are nothing but a speck in the web of my open palm. Your faces flash in the attic of my memory. You are welcome spirits. I toss up the covers, rush to my office. I'm struggling to capture this moment. How do I grasp onto these silvery apparitions? The moment is gone, and I'm left gasping, grasping for something to hold. The distant sound of our dishwasher, some light rain outside, and it's gone, gone, gone. Redistributed away. Dear ghosts, where do your atoms reside? Father, Tata, Nano, Bobo, Chico. My grandparents, the birth family I never knew. I like to think that you still inhabit our planet. We contain multitudes, right? The galaxy and the speck of a birthmark, the one that I call my chocolate spot, my chocolatito plus, that cannot be smudged off. A planet, a galaxy, the cosmos, heaven, in the palm of my hand the size of a mustard seed, head of a needle, where angels reside. Um, let's see which one to read next here. Uh, this is a poem um, that's after uh, the poet James Tate, called Within the Memory Palace. You remember taking your first bite of caribou hanging from the side of a reservoir, somehow losing your glasses and shoes in the same night, being deathly afraid of helicopters, running, running for your life and never looking back. You had a happy childhood, then you awoke in a strange town. You were at a party, off in some corner, alone. Someone kissed you in the dark. You stop running and learn to appreciate strolls through marshes and sand dunes. You even had a chance to sit on a wicker chair for a spell. But the running of your youth was replaced by train tracks, watching the horizon rise and fall while at sea, flying over cliffs in dazzling cities, an exquisite afternoon tea service, getting caught in a rainstorm in church, a honeymoon in Rhode Island, push, 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 you're doing great. So just a, just a few more. Um, and as it was mentioned uh, slightly before, or if I haven't, uh, is that uh, I have Spanish and Portuguese in my background. My last name, Santos, comes from the Portuguese side of my family. And um, so it was wonderful to be here in uh, Bunk uh, BK's poems. Uh, the mention of, of Spanish and Portuguese, um, the refugees and immigrants, um, 
And so that's been an interesting uh, combination to, that made, has made up my life here. So this one is called a nicknames. My parents call each other Chuchi. Was it short for those 80s Monchichi dolls? I don't really know what a chocolatito kiss is, but it was my father's term of endearment for me. My family referred to me as El Nino, both a dear one and an extreme climate event. Um, let's finish with uh, two more. Crystal Pepsi. I watch you asleep in your crib, my heart a pulsar emitting beams of light. Like hummingbirds, your eyelids flicker. Here I am, wishing I were a net. When I am away from you, my heart calls out a plaintive whale song. I must admit, I find this startling when I'm showering or on the web. They say you cannot hold onto a snowflake. But if Pepsi can create clear cola, what then is not possible? Uh, I'll end with two. This one's a short one. Absence. We exist in a world of slashes, bound not by blood, but by absence. Our fathers are ghosts. And uh, finally, amnesiac. It all happened a long time ago. Do you remember? I think there was a nun, a war, the phone call that changed everyone's lives. No, how could you remember? You weren't even there. But that, now that I think about it, neither was I. That moment when you have something to say but forget what you've been saying mid-sentence, I have that right now. I've had that problem my entire life. My history is made of tweezers, removing a splinter from a child's palm, afternoon swims in the plastic turtle pool out back, white bread salami sandwiches. Thank goodness history isn't all goblets and tapestries. Reaching a clearing in the woods, I take a moment to consider my travels. The villagers were right. The view is indeed magnificent. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah, yeah. That was great. That was great. Thank glad you. Yes, I'm glad that the sound worked out uh, after I put this on. Yeah. Great. <laughs> Uh, so now we're moving into the discussion portion, uh, and we can open that up to any audience questions as well. So if anybody has anything they'd like to ask, just post it in the comments, and we'll address it. Um, BK, did you have any questions you uh, wanted to ask Greg? Yeah. Um, this is it's a question about about process. Um, I think I think what you and I do uh, in our books we're kind of a we're kind of a literary excavation. Uh, instead of an, anthro an anthropologist, we're poets who uh, try to excavate and open up the past. Um, and, you know, for, for me, I have access to my uncles and aunts and grandmother uh, and, uh, when she was alive uh, to ask questions about, you know, what was Cambodia like? Uh, most of the time, they don't want to talk about it. Um, uh, it's, it's, uh, it's, it's, it's a history of, of shame, uh, of hurt, um, and it makes sense that they don't want to talk about that. Uh, you, as an adoptee, have a different subject position. Uh, you're writing about the past. There's a poem about your mother. I, I don't know if it was in Siem Reap or Phnom Penh. And you're describing, uh, you're describing uh, the place. You're describing your mother. And I guess the question is, what was that process like uh, uh, in terms of research, but also in terms of memory? Uh, you can put that under quotation. And also in terms of feelings and desires, which we poets you know, uh, uh, do have and, and use it quite a bit. Um, that's, that's my question. 
Okay, uh, that's a very good question. Uh, and uh, I didn't uh, read that poem this time, but yeah, that's, uh, uh, that does appear in Ghostface. And it's a poem about Simria Brown and Cambodia. And uh, what's uh, interesting about that one is I think uh, I, I come with a background where I was raised um, in a home where my, my had my mother and father for, from Spain and Portugal who were my adopted parents when I was adopted at a very young age. Uh, and so I only know bits and pieces of uh, the uh, Khmer side of my, my uh, family. And so that's only been a more recent process, but a lot of the poems um, in Ghostface was started many years ago uh, and I've, I've written a few books and I think they didn't, those poems exploring my uh, adopt, uh, my adoptive background, my birth background um, has taken years uh, for me. And so that poem in particular was interesting because it's right in, written from the point of view of me imagining my birth mother. Um, and um, from there it was, it was a lot of of reading about the 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 country, and I think the thing for me is that I've actually never been to Cambodia, which uh, it's like, and it's something that I've always wanted uh, to do. Uh, something that I'd like to do when when everything kind of clears up in the over the years. And would now with my children are bigger, I always thought, oh, maybe when when they're older, make it a trip and make it as part of a, a kind of historic exploration for myself. So a lot of it has, has to be, been imagined. Um, uh, but then the thing for myself is I, uh, with my family, uh, I have a lot of the, with the Spanish and Portuguese side of my family, um, I had many years of being able to have access to that, those uh, backgrounds of, the, of them being immigrants uh, to Canada as well, from, from Spain and Portugal in the 60s. Uh, but then my father passed away when I was uh, a teenager. And so there's that big loss uh, in my family and in myself that made up a huge part of who I am. And I think a lot of these poems have taken years uh, to simmer. And so then, so at one point it's like, in that poem in particular, I remember just trying to think up of, of like the sounds and tastes and and what with my senses and how to imagine if I were there. And I remember it was even like way, way back when I was uh, at the time, I think I was, I was uh, dating my, my wife at the time. We were a girlfriend and boyfriend and we were, we were, uh, I remember brainstorming ideas and, but I just like, I want this to feel like, how, how, how do I feel authentic with this? I don't know if I ever can. I come at it from a different perspective, uh, be knowing that my, my, my birth family had experienced what had happened in, in Cambodia. And that it's like a lot of it is reconstructing it. And I feel like um, reading poems uh, by books by, by say yourself, BK, uh, has been helpful for me to kind of piece together uh, what might've happened um, and what could have happened. And it fills in those blanks, but I think it, again, it's kind of, yeah. It's taken a long time, and I think there was a time where I wasn't comfortable sharing those poems. I think I had kind of set them aside, so it's not ready yet. Um, for, for my first couple of collections, we're much more um, looking into pop culture and humor um, in my in my previous uh, books, and I still do that. But I think, uh, yeah, uh, I, I uh, imagination was very important, but then also reading and and kind of learning as much about. Uh, that that part of history for myself has been uh, an eye-open experience. I, I, I think you, you used the word authenticity and, and I, I, I don't, because that word is, is loaded and, and, yes. uh, uh, you know, and people could use that word as a way of policing uh, mm -hmm. who is more authentic than others. Uh, yeah. I'll, 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 the reason I asked that question really I think it has to do with we're all reconstructing the past. Um, the poem Inheritance that I just read, I get all that information because I'm a professor, because I'm a teacher. 
Yeah. Because I did the research. I didn't get all that details from my uncles and aunts, even though I had access to them. Yeah. Uh, the, the poem about uh, my mother's uh, death, there's, there's fiction in there. Yeah. We didn't have proper funeral under the Khmer Rouge regime. Yeah. Yeah. So in that poem, I gave my mother a funeral with monks. Yeah. You know, so there's there's reconstruction, there's fiction, there's desires and feelings. Yeah. Um, so, yeah. So just uh, you're for me. I don't know what Khmer is, but you're part Khmer. You know. Yeah. I mean, yeah, absolutely. Anyway, uh, <laughs> that's it. Thank you. And again, when I think I remember once when you when you sent me a message once and you and you said that I'm, I was your my brother. I think that blew my mind in a way, and I think it was something that I, was very meaningful for me to hear, because I think it's something that was uh, was not uh, always there, or at least for, for myself and how I saw myself. Uh, but I think it's something, uh, and I think uh, what I've, I've loved about reading your work, like in The Doctor Will Fix It, um, uh, is, is writing about uh, kind of raising a multiracial uh, daughter, and it's one that I could uh, relate to um in in uh, in your case in america and myself in canada we're we're not we're not that far apart with uh the issues that that surround us and um yeah so i, I just it's been wonderful to be able to to experience your work that way you know, were yeah i mean we we are made uh Sort of into brothers and sisters because of what happened to us. Uh, you were raised in Canada, and I was raised by my uncles and aunts and grandparents uh, and outside of Boston. Uh, yeah. But what marked us, it's not the origin. I don't want us to be defined by the Khmer Rouge and what happened to yeah. us. Yeah. Uh, but uh, it, it sort of brought us uh, a kind of... Uh, in, uh, into a common history, if that makes sense. Yeah, no, it has, and I think I think that's been that's been great to experience through through poetry or through our shared um, uh, interest in, in 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 the art form. Uh, I, I guess one of my questions for you, uh, BK, is um, uh, I've read in, in some of your collections, like you've been. I remember you being into Bukowski. Uh, when you were starting out, I believe. Uh, what, what are some other writers who were, um, I kind of like, made you want to explore poetry as an art form? Well, I, I, uh, I did do well in school, in public school. Uh, I almost dropped out of high school. Um, I. I went into Bunker Hill Community College uh, because my friend's mother made me enroll, uh, and that didn't work out. You know, when when you are attending classes because of other forces, but not because of, of, of something that speaks to you, uh, you, know, you decide to drop out, and I eventually dropped out. Uh, so I didn't have much of, a, of an education. Um, uh, especially in literary studies, uh, it was when I was when 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 after I dropped out, I, I moved to California with my uncles and aunts, who were pursuing their American Cambodian American dream of owning a donut shop, so that they can have enough money to, uh, you know, to uh, uh, enough money for their for the kids to go to college. Um, so when I was in California, I. I was a, a janitor, um, and I, one day I, I went to the library. Uh, I think I was just tired, and um, I just wanted some peace and quiet. And I, 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 I just pick books randomly. I start with with with, with A, uh, uh, with authors whose name began with A, uh, and they just didn't speak uh, uh, to me. Uh, but because because he spoke to me for a couple of reasons, uh, one. Um, is accessible. You don't have to be trained in uh, you know, in, uh, in college to understand Bukowski. Two, he talks about pain, and I could relate to that. Um, 
Um, and three, he talked about people who are outsiders. Uh, I'm not, you know, uh, mm -hmm. I'm, I'm an outsider in terms of being a refugee and also being uh, a racial ethnic minority. Uh, but because the outsiders, as you know, were, were drunks and um, and um, and prostitutes and and uh, and, and so on, uh, but I could relate to him on that level. And from Bukowski, I was introduced to to other uh, writers, but they're not. And I didn't get into Asian American literature until I was in graduate school. Um, so the writers that 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 Bukowski introduced me were Dostoevsky. Uh, Tolstoy. Uh, mm -hmm. I read, you know, French stuff. Uh, you know, Camus was big for for me. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, and American writers, minimalist writers. Uh, Raymond Carr was big. Uh, I was, uh, again, because of the simplicity and clarity, and because he writes about quote unquote normal people, uh, uh, and that spoke to me. Uh, so I think I think I began to be much more immersed in uh, uh, sort of ethnic literature in, in grad school. And, and now and I'm trying to do my best in terms of supporting um, Cambodian writers in the diaspora. Um, I'm, 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 I, 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 I'm sort of part of now of the older generation. There are kids who are second generation. Yeah, uh, and um, and uh, I I do my best to uh, yeah, to support them, and I'm 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 creating this this series as you know you're part of this I invited you, yeah, uh, yeah. and craft, and you know and part of that has to do with you know getting poets to share their perspectives and ideas on the craft of poetry, uh, so that my students and other students can can learn uh, different ways of writing, but then the other sort of reason behind that uh, is to create an opportunity for me to publish uh, and introduce the internet world, uh, Khmer American writers. And you're there, uh, Jen Dai invited her, Sekunteri invited her, uh, I need to invite Bo, uh, but the point is that's, that's uh, so I'm, you know, I think, I think we, we, uh, we're still, we're still forming. Uh, you know, we're still forming, and I think I'm glad that you know you, as the editor in chief uh, of this uh, international magazine, you play a role yeah. in I think uh, you know, the formation of, of uh, part of that of, of, of hopefully Khmer American writers, uh, Khmer American Canadian writers, and so on. Yeah. No, thank you, thank you for for answering that, and um, yeah, I feel like. Um, in a, in a similar position when I, when I was growing up, I wasn't a you know uh, I wasn't an English student. I actually always wanted to somehow be in the arts. I was wanting to do acting. I wanted to do uh, um, that, uh, and and I would write songs. And that's what my, was my first poetry or my first experience mm -hmm. with poetry was not really knowing what I was doing, but I'd write the lyrics or I'd listen to musicians that I uh, liked. But I'd, I'd listen to like you know, the, the doors and uh, just take down a lot of lyrics, but then it was only after, but same thing as Bukowski, and then the, the beats were were big for when I was kind of starting, like, what is poetry? I didn't really know. I just was mm -hmm. seeing what other people did. And then the, the opening up of other writers came afterwards. Um, but I think, yeah, it was that education in terms of learning more about Asian, uh, diaspora writers has come much later and uh, something that I've always trying to make sense of for myself as, as a writer but also to see what's out there as an editor and I feel like um, I, I've been a poetry editor for a number of years but uh, becoming editor-in-chief for this uh, magazine in, in, in Quebec uh, where we publish Anglophone uh, writers has been a wonderful opportunity to um, to share work by writers from from not just in Quebec but writers of color uh, from from all, all different sorts of places, and I think to be able to share these voices that may not have always been represented in in literature, uh, I feel like it's it's something that I have this this uh, 
venue and this platform that I can help. Uh, you know, I feel like I've been in a position where I've been able to do that. So I want to help others who are, are trying to be able to, to put their voices out there. Yeah, uh, absolutely. Um, but I think, I think a lot of us in our generations, uh, I think our, our first sort of immediate love happens to be music. Uh, and then, then that's sort of, you know, after that is poetry. Uh, when you mentioned the doors, uh, you know, and uh, that was a big one. And then the British uh, bands, uh, the Smith and, uh, and Morrissey and the Cure and yeah. all that stuff. Uh, yeah. I, I remember I, I, I did the same in terms of what you did. I wrote a, co a collection of songs that was inspired by Pink Floyd, The Wall. Oh wow! <laughs> the wall, the wall was it for me. Uh, I think yeah. in ninety four, ninety five. So I wrote this song instead of having pink. There's a command narrator, a command character. Oh, yeah. That's very interesting. So I had like fifteen songs or so, and I had no idea about music at all. Right, I'm just writing the words, the lyrics. Uh, yeah. But that that was our first love, um, and I think it still is actually, uh, for yeah. me. Uh, mm -hmm. Yeah. No. One thing that I've, I've, I mean, now that every in the pan, in the pandemic, I feel like something that that uh, I miss that I used to do all the time was to go to like uh, downtown Montreal and go to HMV uh, or go to a bookstore and like and just browse through CDs. And uh, I think one thing which was fun was like to to like l listen to albums that I'd never like I didn't know anything about, and I would rem I remember I'd go and I'd, I'd listen. To, for like, I remember discovering Jack Johnson uh, right. when, because because of like, I, who is this Jack Johnson fellow? And I'm just uh, randomly putting it on, and just that experience is not there anymore. Or going, you know, so it's it's odd, but I feel like uh, yeah, I don't know. <laughs> music is still very important. I always have to have music um, kind of in the background when I'm when I'm writing. I find, and it's something I've done even when I was studying when I was. Uh, when I was a kid or a teenager, I remember it was a funny story. I remember uh, that I used to have to, I asked permission at school to be able to, to get a, like to have headphones and listening to like my, I don't know if I was a, my CD player, little, little mini disc uh, player so that I could like study with the music and I wasn't like up to any mischief or whatever, <laughs> but just so that I could, I was doodling and whatever, but it, it helped me think it helped me study. It helped me uh, um, make sense of the world around me. So. Yeah. Um, do you guys have any, I know you've spoken about your influences, but what are some of the books that you're reading now or that you're, you would recommend to people to read right now? Uh, I, you know, if you're interested in uh, Khmer American writing, I have mm -hmm. three recommendations. Uh, one, uh, it's by Sukuntari Swai. It's called Apsara in New York. Um, uh, and, uh, you know, she's a 1.5 generation. She, uh, she was born in a refugee camp uh, in Thailand. Uh, a second generation, Monica Salk, uh, A Nail, The Evening Hangs On. Uh, so another wonderful book. Uh, yeah, I, I read that. It's a brand new one, right? <laughs> yep, yep. And there's a third one uh, that's coming out, uh, a third poet, uh, and I, I used to, uh, I was an editor of, uh, of this magazine back in the 1990s with uh, my friend, uh, uh, oh my gosh, uh, uh, Teveret uh, Bunkustam, uh, and it was called Khmer Voice and Poetry. And there was this guy, his name was Chad Pearsat, and uh, he was submitting these poems that I really, really dig, I really love. And I finally met him a couple of years ago. Um, and uh, so he's having a book coming out in, in August called uh, On Earth Beneath uh, Sky. Uh, it's coming out by uh, Loom Press, uh, August 23rd or 24th. Um, so uh, check that out. Great. Um, yeah, I, I have a few books that I was going to recommend. Um, uh, one of them, uh, which is just because the... Uh, I think the adoptee experience is also something that uh, there isn't a lot of literature there uh, about that side of the uh, experience. And so whenever I've been reading uh, some some uh, writers who have been exploring that, I've been really 
uh, helpful and wonderful to me because it, it's different for everybody. Uh, so there's uh, this book, which is um, called uh, Older Sister Not Necessarily Related by uh, uh, Jenny uh, Hyejun Wills. And um, uh, she's um, was an adoptee from, um, from South Korea and then uh, adopted as an infant into a white family in small town Canada. Uh, and uh, so it's, it's a wonderful uh, and powerful uh, memoir um, in terms of uh, other uh, books, not add up to related necessarily, but also just uh, uh, this is a, uh, The Loudest Thing by Joshua Levy. And so he's uh, one of the uh, closer friend of mine. Um, I've known him since high school and we've been supportive of one another for for uh, many years, and uh, it's his debut book of poetry. It just came out right before the pandemic hit, so uh, it's 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 hard when you have like this new book, right? And then it's just been really challenging to get the word out. But it's a it's a wonderful uh, debut book of poetry, um, and uh, uh, the last one is a uh, by a, um, a a poet who's a prose a poet. And I've never met, it's uh, Jose Hernandez Diaz. Um, the, he has the new book, uh, chapbook called The Fire Eater. And um, I, I do really enjoy prose poems by like James Tate and uh, uh, the kind of the oddness and the surreal uh, nature of, of those uh, poems. And anyway, so it's a brand new chapbook and have been enjoying going through that. Um, but also just wanting to also support um, writers of, of color. Those look really awesome. Um, I'll have to get them myself. If, if anybody watching wants any copies, they can get them at Read It Again Bookstore. Kim posted links in the comments. And don't forget that you can also get copies of BK's and Greg's books, including if you want to pre-order Greg's book, uh, Ghostface, which will be coming out very soon. Very soon. <laughs> Yeah, absolutely. Um, check out our web our website, or if you have uh, indie bookstores in your area that are, are local, support those as well. Um, and everybody can join us next week, uh, same time, same place, uh, with Kiki Petrosino and uh, Jason Schneiderman. Uh, so have a good night, everyone. See you next week. Thank you, Thank you so much. Thank you. Thanks, Greg.